Monica Charette, and this is Holding the Light. As long as you love, I will whisper in your ear. Little whispers you will hear. As long as you love. If there's one thing I've learned in this journey, it's that grief is such an individual and deeply personal experience. Even parents who are mourning the same child loss grieve differently. It's something I've come to better understand and respect with time and experience. In this podcast, Ed Gould shares how he and his wife Lynn reacted and coped very differently after the sudden loss of their son Matthew but they found common ground on which to walk together along their path to healing over the last 10 years. Ed is candid about Matt's challenges with bipolar disease, which he says is what ultimately led to his early and tragic passing at the age of 22. He talks about what he has learned about himself during the grieving process and offers some good advice for newly bereaved parents. And you'll be inspired to learn how this father is honoring his son's memory. We are so glad you're with us today as we are honoring one father's grief and holding the light with Ed Gould. I am so pleased to have Ed Gould as our guest today. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us to share the story of your son, Matthew, and your very personal journey in grief and healing. Thank, thanks for asking me. Yes. I expect many parents, and especially fathers who are going to be listening to this podcast, um, will find your perspective, I think, very relatable, Ed. Um, the loss of a child, as you well know, is the most life-altering experience, um, and men and women often grieve differently, and I want to explore that more in our conversation, but let's just start by having you share Matt's story, if you will. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Matt was uh, one of four, four kids that Lynn and I have been blessed to have as uh, a part of our uh, family. He was, um, he was a, a middle child. He was the third of four. Our oldest is a uh, uh, is um, our daughter Kate. Uh, Matt's brother Andy came next, uh, then Matt, and then our youngest Kelly. And they were all born within four and a half years of uh, one another. So they were all really uh, packed in there. And, um, you know, I'd like to think that all of them had a fairly, um, uh, had a good childhood, fairly ordinary childhood growing up in uh, Bangor. You know, they were all active in, in, different uh, sorts of activities. Matt was a swimmer. Uh, Kate and Kelly, his uh, sisters, were uh, swimmers. Uh, but Matt always had a, uh, Matt always had a drive, I think, to, to, to go someplace bigger than Bangor. So when he graduated from high school, uh, he went to school in Boston. Uh, and um, the first couple of years, his freshman and sophomore years were reasonably, reasonably uh, uneventful, at least as far as we knew. Uh, but then he started to have some troubles. He had troubles with grades. Uh, and um, Thanksgiving of his junior year, when he came home for Thanksgiving, he said, I don't want to go back. And we said, well, that's fine. You know, what's going on? And he wouldn't share, share it with us. So we didn't really know what was going on. So, um, so Matt lived at home uh, with us. Uh, Kelly was still at home. Uh, by that point in time, Kate was, um, I don't think she, she'd either just graduated from college or was about to graduate from college, but she was essentially out of the house. Uh, and Andy was, was in college and he was kind, kind of in and out. Um, but we, we started having issues. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt had some substance abuse issues, uh, marijuana and, and underage, uh, drinking because he was, uh, 20. Uh, at at that uh, point in time, and so and that that you know led to some conflict, and we said, look, you know, you are welcome here as long as you want, but there are going to be rules here, and uh, if you want to stay here, you got to follow the rules. 
uh, and he would for a while, but then, you know, more issues would come up. I mean, one, one, I remember one morning we were getting ready to, to, to go to work and we got a call all from the emergency room at Eastern Maine because uh, he'd been picked up for underage drinking in uh, in Orono and he had a, an astronomical blood alcohol uh, level. That must have been so scary um, for you. Well, yeah, I mean, it was. <laughs> you know, it's 7.30 in the morning yeah. and you get a phone call from a nurse saying your son's in the emergency room. Um, so, you know, we, we tried to work through those uh, those issues and um, it, it, it was it was a bumpy road. Uh, and then finally, uh, five months before uh, Matt passed away, uh, you know, I remember I had to go to a I had to go down to uh, the Washington, D.C. area for a um, for a deposition. And um, he was he took the car uh, the night before with our permission. He said he was going to go over to a friend's house. He didn't come home. He didn't come home. And, you know, we're sending him texts trying to figure out uh, what, what's going on. And, um, you know, I mean, I've got, I've got to leave the house at, you know, 4.30 in the morning to catch an early flight down to D.C. And um, we've got no idea where he is. And so, um, you know, Lynn, my wife, Lynn, finally said to me, look, you got to go. You know, we'll keep this up. I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll keep you in the loop. And so I flew down to D.C. I got to a hotel and I started making phone calls uh, from there. And, and, I mean, we we're calling emergency rooms. We we're calling law enforcement and trying to find out what was going on. And um, finally, uh, we found out that um, he had... Uh, I, I mean, I can remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> I was on my way back from DC and I was sitting in, um, in one of the terminals at LaGuardia and Lynn called me and said, they, you know, we, we found him. And what happened was he was driving the car. Uh, he was, he was drunk. Uh, he flipped the car over. The car was completely totaled. Uh, and so he'd been arrested for OUI. Uh, in, in, this is in Hancock County. Uh, and um, so uh, he, he got booked in Ellsworth and then released. And he walked from Ellsworth to Acadia Hospital and checked himself in. Wow. Uh, and I remember coming back from, from I remember, I remember being, being just, you know, being in tears, uh, sitting there in the terminal, thankful that he had been uh, found. And um, so it, the minute I got back from, from DC, I went to Acadia and I was able to visit with him. And he, as horrible as that sounds and as horrible as his ultimate death was five months later, that kicked off a process, at least for Lynn and me, um, that was healing. Because for the, the, he was admitted to Acadia. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, but he went, he went through a process. And for the next five months, nobody, nobody could have worked harder than Matt did to try to get better. And he did. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he faithfully went to uh, his therapy. Of course, we took him. He wasn't driving. Uh, and I, I mean, he went so far to get uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Mm -hmm. And he decided to do that. It was recommended for him. And he went along with it on his own. And over those five months, um, we started to see the old Matt come back. Uh, I mean, Matt was always somebody that was just, you know, full of energy. Uh, he was fierce. Uh, if you were his friend, uh, he was fiercely loyal. He and Kelly, uh, of course, they were so close. They were 54 weeks uh, apart with their birthdays. Uh, they were always best friends. And um, he worked to get better, and he dedicated himself to get better. And we saw that. And and we started to, you know, look. 
like I said, we started to see the old Matt get back. Uh, and, and, um, and so we were, you know, we obviously supported him in that, that process. Um, and he started to go back to work. Um, and I remember one day I was bringing him back from ECT and I mean, ECT is very different these days from, you know, the, the image of shock therapy that you have from the movies and from one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but he, he'd be in kind of a burn fog for a while, uh, after one of his sessions. So I remember I was bringing him home and uh, he said, he said to me in the car, he said, dad, I wrecked the car, didn't I? I said, yeah, you did, Matt. He said, well, I'm sorry. He said, I'll get you a new one. <laughs> and I said, listen, don't worry about that. You know, we got plenty of time to work on stuff like that, Matt. So, um, you know, he, he was sincere and dedicated to the healing process, not just for himself, but I think, I think he had a, a sense of what his, his issues brought to the family dynamic. And I think he was working on that. Um, so, um, like I said, he was going through this process of getting better. And then that brings me to 10 years ago next Tuesday, which is the anniversary of his death. Um, Matt was, um, Matt was working in a restaurant as a server. And, um, I remember I picked him up the night before, brought him home from work. It was late. He hadn't had any dinner. I think he took a snack up, uh, to work and, um, I mean, took, took a snack up to his room and, uh, he, he went to bed. Uh, and, uh, the next morning he was supposed to go back to work at, I don't know, just probably the noontime shift or something like that. But anyway, he was at home, Kelly was at home and, uh, Kelly had to go to work and Kelly didn't drive either. So it was about 10 30 in the morning. I came home from, um, came home from work to give them both a ride to work. And so, um, Kelly was up, Matt hadn't come out of his room. So I started to knock, knock on the door and holler at him, Matt, get up, get up. You got to go to work. I didn't answer, didn't answer. And so, you know, I went in his room and he was sitting up in his bed, uh, with his laptop, uh, in his lap. And, um, I started to shake him and he wasn't responsive. And Kelly came in and said, should I call 911? And I said, yeah. Um, uh, and so the, the 911 operator was helping me through giving him CPR. And I had to, I had to drag him off the, the bed so I could get some, some purchase for the, uh, chest compressions. And, um, I told Kelly, uh, to go wait for the first responders. And I said, get the dogs up into your room and, um, uh, you know, br bring them up here. And so I'm, I'm trying to give him CPR and he's, he, he's not responding. And uh, the EMTs came and they, you know, they ushered me out of the room, but on the way out of the room, I heard one of them say, Oh, he's cold. Oh my gosh. So, so I, you know, I, I knew he'd been gone for some time. I don't know how, how long. Uh, and, um, <laughs> I, 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 like I said, I can remember the day like it was yesterday. It was Wednesday. It was, it was cloudy and gloomy. Uh, and, uh, we had no idea what happened. And of course it's an unattended death. So, mm -hmm. so the police came. And, um, you know, they had, they had to interview us and, um, he was taken for an autopsy. Uh, and you know, we had, had his funeral. We still didn't know what the cause of death was. Uh, and, um, it took, I believe it was 10 months for us to get a, a final autopsy. And the cause of death was, um, unintentional overdose. Uh, he had been, t he, he was on a number of medications for his bipolar. 
and uh, and so they, they found oxycodone uh, in the uh, toxicology uh, results, but it was the equivalent. His blood level was um, the equivalent of uh, a single tab, so that all of his all I mean he didn't try to take his own life because all of his medications were at the prescribed level, but somehow for some reason that we've never known. He had an oxycodone. He didn't get in the house because we didn't have it here. You know, our presumption is that somebody at work gave it to him. You know, our guess is that Matt always said he had a hard time sleeping. And I think somebody probably said, I'll try one of these. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that, you know, one of those was enough to suppress his uh, central nervous system and make him stop bleeding, uh, breathing. So, um, as horrible uh, as that all has been, uh, we have been able to take several things out of that. Yeah, tell me about that. I and the first, yeah, well, the, well, the first thing that we were able to take out of that was we had those five months with him before he died. Mm-hmm. Those five months when he was he was trying to change. He was trying to be better. And we started to get the old Matt back. And those five months are a blessing. And when Matt went to bed that that night, and I said, I said, Good night, Matt, I love you. He said, I love you too, Dad. And those those are my last words with him. And I treasure that. Um, you know, as awful as it all was. Um, we didn't have any what ifs. You know, we didn't have to ask ourselves, you know, if we had said, Matt, you know, uh, we can't take you, we we can't take these phone calls from the emergency room. We can't take you drinking. Um, You're going to have to go out on your own and go someplace else and kick. We had discussions like that. What should we do? I mean, are we enabling him by letting him stay here? Do, Do we have to give him tough love? And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we hoped that we could help him more by uh, him being with us. Um, but, we, you, know, you know, if that had happened and he died, God, I, you know, I wouldn't, we, Lynn and I would not be able to forgive ourselves. So that didn't happen. So, you, you know, we were able to, we didn't know, obviously we didn't know we were doing it at the time, but we were able to work out those issues with him in those five months that we had. And, you know, the fact that, you know, our last words were, I love you. I, 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 yeah, I treasure that. I'm grateful that you had that time with him. Um, it's such a story, it's such a tragic story, but I can just feel all the hope that you had during those five months. Yeah. And, and you know, we didn't, we didn't fool ourselves. <clears throat> we, we, you know, you know, we, we know recovery isn't a, um, you know, steady line. And, you know, as, as I, I look back on <clears throat> those months and how he was getting better, um, and I talk to him every night before I go to bed and I tell him, I said, you know, look, Matt, I, I you know, I know <laughs> that, that, that was not a, a straight line of recovery and there were going to be a lot of ups and downs and we were going to have some problems, but we were fully dedicated to that journey with him. And I wish we had that chance and we didn't, so, and, uh, you know, that, you know, they're, they're, they're all the stages of grief and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, uh, I've never tried to go back and analyze, you know, where I was, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the grief, the anger, the, um, I've forgotten what they are, but, um, you know, I, I think, I think everybody goes through them to, to, you know, one extent, uh, uh, or uh, another, but um, you know, it's um, having that opportunity to what 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 I meant to say was that um, you know I don't think we fool ourselves that that if we hadn't lost Matt that uh, it was all going to be uh, sunshine and daisies uh, going forward. Um, but um, but the other thing is, you know, looking back is that we did have 22 years with, 
really incredible kid. And I wish we had more, but we didn't. And I, and I, I'm at the point where I'm thankful that we had those 22 years. That's, that's really helpful for a lot of people who were listening, um, who may be just starting in this process. It, take, it, <clears throat> it takes a long time to get there. Sure does. Yeah. Sure does. But, but at least, at least for us, we, we, at least we can appreciate it. So during this process of, you know, going through all these stages of grief, have you found anything in particular that has helped in your healing substantially? Have you tried therapy or like group therapy or things of that matter? Or? It, it, I, I, ha, I have not. Um, Lynn did uh, for a bit shortly after he died. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, like like I was saying to you guys uh, before, um, I'm I'm a big advocate for mental health. I'm a big advocate for <clears throat> eliminating the the stigma associated with uh, mental illness. Um, but I haven't I I haven't taken advantage of it for myself, and I don't I don't know why. It's it's me. It's not because of you know any any uh, reluctance. Uh, you know, I, you know, my, my personality is such that, um, it's hard for me to accept help. Uh, and I, I try to do stuff on my own. That's a failing of mine because I know people are out there that, that want to help and are willing to help. Um, so I've basically done it myself, but you know, when I have spoken to some people that have lost loved ones, I've, I've told them, go get help. Mm-hmm. You really, you really should. Well, it's very personalized. You, know, mm-hmm. you just can't generalize from person to person how people will cope or what they need yeah. to survive. But um, so, tell me about the differences between you and your wife, because I think men and women do grieve in very different ways. And and how do you how do you go on that journey together and support each other? Um. <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I, we were so different the day that that he died. I, um, <clears throat> I think I was in shock, and I was just sort of like a robot. I mean, I, 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 I don't know that I showed much emotion that day. Um, and I remember I. <laughs> I remember when, when the police were here, I was, Lynn was at work and I was saying, I've got to go. I've got to, I've got to tell Lynn, I've got to let her know what happened. And then finally, when I, when I could go, um, I went to, um, she was a, a preschool teacher. Mm-hmm. And so I went to her school and, um, you know, I went to the, the office and I told them what happened and I needed to talk to Lynn. And, um, and she came in and I, I, I told her and she, she fell to the floor and was just, you know, completely in tears. So, <laughs> I mean, she was, she was the outlet of all of those emotions and I wasn't letting myself feel them that day. And then I, I remember that night I couldn't sleep and I went downstairs to the, the kitchen and I just wailed mm. and Lynn came down and Kelly came down and they they comforted me and uh, and it helped so I, I mean she let it out I held it in uh, until that night and, and like I said a few minutes ago um, she she got some counseling for a period of time and and what I did was I just compartmentalized mm-hmm. I said I, I, I literally took things, a day at a time, an hour at a time, a minute at a time. I said, okay, what do I have to do now? Mm-hmm. Okay, what needs to be done today? Mm-hmm. And I would try and focus on that and um, try and leave, try and set, set, set up a box for myself for some later point in time to try and deal with my emotions. But that's how, you know, I'd compartmentalize. I'd say, okay, well, today I have this that I have to do and I, I need to get, get through that. Then I'll move on to the next thing. Whereas, you know, Lynn was 
went through that whole process of, um, you know, processing those emotions. And I'm very lucky to have her because she's very supportive. And we've, we've, uh, this year was our 39th, uh, anniversary. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No. Get that right, Ed. Get that right. (laughs) No, yeah, edit that out. No, this is our, this is our 40th anniversary. Uh. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And um, so um, we've both been able to talk it out uh, with one another. I mean, I, I you know, I do tend uh, t- to keep it to myself, um, but we've always been able to talk about him. Uh, and, um, you know, things will happen like with me. That will remind me. I remember um, we went to see Steely Dan at the water waterfront, and there was somebody that was. It was a young guy that was, um, you know, selling concessions, and um, he just reminded both of us so much of Matt. He was tall and thin. Uh, he had a similar hair and a similar complexion, and like the both of us just kind of looked at each other and said, "Wow." Mm. he could be Matt. And so, you know, we share a lot of stories like that. And, and now it's, it's, it's easy and enjoyable to share those stories. And, um, and, uh, you know, it feels good because it brings back the time that we, we did have. That's that's so important. I think mm -hmm. for other parents to hear, especially if they're in the first stages of grief, because you probably remember this and you, I mentioned you still feel this way, but you just don't want people to ever forget them. I mean, they had, they lived here and it was important oh, abs- for people to remember who they are and say their name, you know, and not stop talking about them and sharing their stories. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I admire so much what, what you guys do to honor Cass and, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, the, the reason I got into big brothers and big sisters was because Matt was a big and um, tell us I wanted to that. continue his work. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, Matt went, when he was in high school, uh, he was a big and um, he was with, it was, he was in the school based program. Uh, and so he'd see his little uh, weekly uh, at, at uh, his little school. And, um, it, at that point in time, the, uh, the, uh, big brothers, big sisters program in Penobscot County had a policy that, um, I, I think the littles w- would age out and they would, when they got to a certain point, they, they, uh, switch to a different big. And, and that's when Matt's fierceness came out he said, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to change. He doesn't want to change. Uh, I want to, I want to continue this, uh, relationship and he fought. And so they changed the policy and he was able to have another year or two with uh, his little, and he won one of the uh, WLBZ, WCH, C, S, H, uh, teens who care, uh, awards be because of, of what he did. And that, that, that's how, how fierce and loyal, uh, Matt would be, you know, I can tell you. That if you're on the other side of the fence from Matt, that, you know, <laughs> he'd hold a grudge too. But but if you're on the right side of the fence with him, uh, he was a fierce and loyal uh, friend and advocate uh, for you. And, um, and uh, so uh, a couple of years after Matt passed away, I was approached by the then uh, executive director of uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Mid Maine, and asked if um, you know if I want to uh, serve on the board. And I thought it would be a great way to to honor and continue uh, Matt's uh, memory. Uh, and I'm also on the board of Acadia Hospital, and that's because I, I, you know, fortunately Matt was able to get help for his mental health. Uh, condition. And uh, I think that's really important. So I wanted, I do that in his memory too. I think that's awesome. But you know, after, after Matt died, immediately after Matt died, we were just flooded 
by, um, you know, emails from, from people that, uh, you know, we didn't know. And they reached out to us. Um, and, and Matt was gay. Uh, and we, uh, we, we got a number of emails from people that we didn't know. And they told us that Matt was so helpful and supportive of them to deal with being young and gay uh, in the Bangor area uh, and just really supportive. And it just, it just absolutely floored us how many people he touched in a short time. That's incredible. And it's so healing, isn't it? It helps in your healing. Oh, yeah. 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 And, And, you know, I want that to be remembered. Of course, we all we all want to remember Matt in that way. What would you give for advice for for fathers? I think that I think you could really provide hope for some fathers out there who feel like probably feeling pretty alone in this in their grief. Well, you're not alone. Um, there are people that that love you and care for you, uh, and will support you. Um, y- you don't have to keep it in. Um, I, you know, I think I kind of kept it in because that was part of my compartmentalizing. And if, if I could, you know, if I could compartmentalize my day, then I could go a period of time and not deal with the grief and be functional. And that worked for me. Um, but I didn't suppress it. You know, I found times and ways to um, to deal with it, uh, and you got to find your own way to to deal with it. And I think the first thing that you have to do is to understand your own relationship with your loved one, and hopefully, it was a good relationship. I mean, you know, like I said, it, it with Matt, if we didn't have those five months, and you know, if you know, the issues that we had with him had continued. I, we would have had a lot of unresolved issues and we're really fortunate that we didn't. Uh, and I, and if you are someone who does have unresolved issues, you're not going to be able to resolve them with the loved one anymore. You got to resolve them with yourself and you can't do that alone. You got to go out you, you got to find some help, whether it's friends, family, professional help. You got to work that through, or it's going to eat you alive. I agree. How about um, how about the other siblings? How are your other children coping, and how did they do back then, and how are they doing today? Well, they all had very different relationships with Matt. Like I said, Kelly and he they were they were like best friends. Uh, and, um, you know, Kelly has, has grown, she still lives with us uh, and I'm, I'm thankful that she does. Um, and she is, she's dealt with it, uh, and she's found ways to deal with it. She's never shared it. She's never been willing to talk about it with me. And I don't think she's talked about it with, um, Lynn, um, but she had a healthy relationship with Matt. So, uh, that was, that was good. Uh, and that's helped her. Uh, Andy, uh, Andy was Matt's big brother in uh, more ways than one. I mean, Matt, Matt was tall and thin. Andy was tall and a football, uh, (laughs) player. And, um, I I think Andy kind of saw himself as Matt's protector. Not that he really needed one. Cause like I said, Matt could be fierce, but, uh, you know, I think there's stuff that went on that when he was in high school and when he was a teenager that Andy never really shared with us. And Matt certainly didn't share with us. So I think uh, Andy kind of saw him as, as Matt's, saw himself as Matt's um, uh, protector. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, he went on and uh, he's living in New Hampshire now. He's married. Uh, he and his wife have uh, um, a one-year-old. Um, and again, I think Matt had a, 
Um, I mean, Andy had a, had a good relationship with Matt. I, you know, we haven't talked about it either, uh, but that helped. Kate and Matt would always butt heads. Um, I mean, of course, Kate was the oldest. And so, you know, she was, uh, she was haunted by first child (laughs) syndrome (laughs) that she was the oldest. She was the one that if we said no, that, that she was the first one that we'd say no to. And then if one of the younger, you know, finally we got enough experience with three more kids that, that we weren't quite so hung up that we'd you know loosen up our grip a little bit she she'd resent the fact that that uh she didn't get the same treatment because she was uh, the firstborn um but she and matt uh, always butted heads and and one of matt's i guess you could call it a skill is he always knew which buttons to push and he could always push kate's buttons and one of the and one of the problems would be that when we'd be sitting around the dinner table, uh, I, I couldn't stop from laughing at it, which just made Kate that much more angry. And of course, Matt absolutely knew it too. And so he was getting at her through me. Um, so she had a conflicted relationship with him. And and I know that she resented uh, the fact that we were having difficulties uh, with him for a period of time. Uh, and, uh, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't like that part of, part of him. Um, but Kate now is married with a four-year-old and what she has, uh, shared with us is that now that she's a parent, uh, she gets it. So, um, you know, I think they're all in different places. Uh, and I think they're all in healthy places. I don't think Kate was in a healthy place for a period of time, but, you know, parenthood has certainly helped her. You can't that. go through that experience without having it change your life profoundly at no. any age. No. I think yeah. we can attest to that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you being so open and honest about this. I know it's hard but it's important. It's so important to share your stories. And, um, you know, if we could leave people with something today, if you could share, how would you like us to remember Matthew? Well, we said in his obituary that um, he would light up a room when he walked in. Uh, and it's kind of funny, you know, Matt, Matt had a certain amount of vanity, uh, and he had the whitest teeth you could imagine. I mean, I don't know if you remember the Friends episode <clears throat> when Ross, Ross had his teeth whitened and they glowed in the dark. I mean, Matt was kind of close. <laughs> Matt was kind of close to that level. I mean, it got to the point that, that he would drink hot coffee through a straw just so that, that he wouldn't get, get coffee stains on, on his teeth. Um, but, uh, but when he walked in the room and he would smile and you'd see those, those teeth, you know, the room was different. The room really was different. And, um, you know, like I said, he was the kind of person that uh, you would be touched by him just by knowing him. Um, and <laughs> when, he was, when he was a baby, um, he had the biggest cheeks. And uh, his his uncle used to say that those cheeks were part of his essential madness, and he always had those those kind of rosy apple cheeks, you know, even uh, as as he grew up. But uh, but you know that that fierceness and that spirit he had really was the uh, essential madness, and you couldn't miss it. You you really you couldn't miss it. You know, once you once you came into uh, contact with him and he was, he was obviously a very complicated human being. Uh, but in his soul, um, he was gold. And, um, that's the way I remember him. Essential madness. I love that. <laughs> I wish that I had up the, had the opportunity to know him and 
but we feel like we do Thank know you. him through you. So, yeah. well, you know, I, I, I remember him every day, multiple times a day. Uh, and, and I know that other people that um, he's touched remember him too. And we still talk about him. Never. I mean, every, him. every, no, I mean, every year on his birthday and on the anniversary of his passing, I post something about him on uh, Facebook and uh, that usually prompts some, some memories. And so that's a, uh, that's a, uh, that's a healing experience. Well, you and your family and your story is very inspiring and um, gives great hope for all of us who are still and forever grieving. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you. Well, same here, Colby. And thank you, Monica. Um, Thanks for asking me. You know, I was kind of, I had some trepidation uh, about doing this, uh, particularly so close to the uh, anniversary of his uh, death. Um, because I didn't know what I was going to pull out. Um, but thanks for helping me go through this as well. As long as you love. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast helpful, please share our link with others and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. I'm Monica Charette, reminding you that you are never alone in your grief. Until next time, We'll be right here with you, holding the light. As long as you love. As long as you love.